What's happening Hardscapers? Today we're going to talk about the five reasons why retaining walls fail. Let's get into this. My name is Mike and I own and operate a small hardscape company in the Toronto, greater Toronto area. And I started in this business working for a supplier, eventually started working on the side and then started my own business. And in doing so, I started with these hardscape maintenance projects. This typically involved a lift and relay of pavers that were sinking and settling or retaining walls that were failing. So I've got a lot of experience in fixing these and I've got a lot of mistakes, common mistakes that I've seen in the field when it comes to fixing retaining walls. Specifically in this video, I'm gonna be talking about segmental retaining walls. These are using retaining wall blocks and they are the type of retaining walls that we fix, we install in our business. There are multiple reasons why these fail. Each of these reasons why they fail could be combined together to cause a major failure or just be the same single cause to the failure itself. And that's why following the engineered drawings that are typically provided by the manufacturer of the wall block that you'll be installing is incredibly important as well as following just simple rules of thumb. But if your wall is over a certain height or there's a specific surcharge that is greater than usual on top of the wall that is putting direct force on the wall or if that wall will experience greater than normal hydrostatic pressure or there's a steep slope at the toe of the wall, all of these reasons are causes outside of the reasons what I'm going to give you. So specifically in this video, we're gonna be talking about five reasons why retaining walls fail beyond just abnormal reasons that would require an engineer to actually provide engineered stamp drawings if your wall is over a certain height, which will be decided upon a governing body in your region. Or like I said, there's a significant surcharge on the top of the wall that's putting force on the wall, or there's a great slope at the toe of the wall beyond the wall. And first things first is base depth. This is what I typically see with retaining walls, not so much the base material, which is a common failure that we see in pavers. But with retaining walls, I typically see underneath them that a proper graded aggregate has been used, whether that's A gravel, granular A, three quarter inch minus, three quarter inch down to fines, whatever you wanna call it, or an open graded stone, a three quarter inch clear stone. I typically never see something like stone dust or limestone screening underneath a retaining wall. So in my experience, the aggregate used is typically correct. It's the base depth, the depth of that base that is typically incorrect. And what that causes is settling in your wall or heaving of your wall, and you'll notice it with your lines of wall layers. You'll see that they're not straight, they're not even anymore. Instead, they're starting to bow up and down. That's causing that. We do like to use a geotextile to separate our subsoil from our base material, and then have a minimum of six inches to eight inches of base material followed by our first course of wall block. We also want to make sure that that base extends at least six inches in front of the wall and at least 12 inches behind the wall. That's going to give a solid foundation for that wall to sit on. And the second reason is compaction. Compaction is incredibly crucial with your base with any hardscaping project. And this begins with compacting your subsoils properly and then moving on to using a geotextile at the bottom of your base and then moving through your base preparation as you would depending on the capabilities of your plate compactor. A general rule of thumb with compaction is for every 1,000 pounds of centrifugal force provided by your compactor, you can compact an inch worth of material. So make sure that you understand what the force is provided by your compactor so you can decide how much you can efficiently and effectively compact your base. The smallest compactor provided by your local rental store is probably not gonna do it and you should look into getting something delivered if you can't actually pick one up yourself. Moving on after the base compaction, the base depth and the extensions on the base, we get into the embedment of the wall. And this is a minimum of six inch embedment. And what that means is that your trench needs to be dug out from the final grade to the base of that trench, the height of your base depth, which for us is a minimum of six to eight inches, plus six inches of wall block that's going to be actually buried 
below that final grade. That means at least that first layer of wall block is going to be completely hidden from sight. And what this does is it actually prevents the kick out of that retaining wall caused by pressure behind that wall. We want to make sure that we have a solid foundation for our wall block to not only sit on but also to be able to withstand that kick out. It's scary to come upon a retaining wall, especially a very large retaining wall that doesn't have that embedment. And you can actually see the base material being washed out from underneath that wall and it's just gonna cause failure to come in the near future for those retaining walls. The next thing that we usually see is the backfilled area. Earlier in this video, I talked about 12 inches behind the wall also needs to be prepared. This is the drainage area in behind the wall, and this should be filled with a three quarter inch clear stone or whatever is specced out by your manufacturer or the engineer. This clear stone has no fines in it. It is completely open. It allows water to go completely through it with minimal resistance. So we don't want soil in behind that wall, directly in behind that wall, causing it to absorb water and to put hydrostatic pressure on the back of that wall, pushing it forward, or in the freeze-thaw cycles that we experience, for that to put also pressure on that wall. We want to control that water. So that water, if it gets into our drainage area behind that wall, we have a nice cushion from the back of the drainage area to the back of the wall, where that water is going to move down to the base of that wall. And then from there, we need to decide what we're gonna do with it. Oftentimes, if I see a wall being pushed forward and it's going to topple over, it's because there's no drainage material in behind it. Now, some people say that there should be some sort of geotextile on the back of that retaining wall drainage area. Some people say there shouldn't because the contamination will be vertical rather than horizontal. So we don't need to be worried about the contamination of the subsoil and behind the wall into that drainage material. I'm gonna leave that debate for another day. But what I do wanna talk about finally is number five here, and that is drainage. We talked about the backfill area for drainage, but we also need to talk about what we're gonna do with that water that has accumulated in our drainage area if it's not able to work its way through our subsoil. And what we do with that is we have a drainage pipe, a perforated drainage pipe to collect that water. If we're using a dense graded aggregate for our base material, our drainage pipe is going to be nearly on top of that base material. As water moves through our drainage area, hits that dense graded aggregate, it could start to build up and that's why we have that perforated pipe to collect that water and to move it out of the system somewhere. This is usually done to a lower area on either side of the wall, wherever for that wall ends or through the face of that wall. If you're using open graded base from the backfill material all the way through to the base material, that drainage pipe should be a bit lower in the preparation of your trench so that as water accumulates, it gets picked up quicker. And then you're looking for a lower area to take that water and to move it to. But those are the five reasons why I see retaining walls fail in my experience. If you have anything else that you would like to add, leave it in the comment section below. And if you wanna learn more about retaining wall paver construction, we have a members only platform that you can check out. That's members.howtohardscape.com. Link will be in the description, as well as definitely check out the videos on our channel that will be also showing up here if you wanna learn more about retaining wall installation or paver installation as well. Like this video if you found it helpful for whatever reason and subscribe to this YouTube channel for more content like this. Thank you so much for watching.